Welcome to the Yule special edition of the Velocity of Now. Now, as you know, last week we had some horrific sound issues, and the mic before we went on live last week was perfect. As soon as we got on the air, it started to go funny. We seem to be having the same problem again tonight, so bear with us. We will get through it just like we got through it last week. If the sound deteriorates, I'll just switch to the laptop mic. There's really no reason why this is happening, because I have a very good microphone and mixer. But there you go. So anyway, welcome to the Velocity of Now, the Yule special. It's December 24th, 2014, and you're listening to the Velocity of Now with me, your host, Thomas Sheridan. You can just look out, you can look out for my work on thomasheridanarts.com, and also you can follow the YouTube versions of the show through newsymbolsmedia.tv. I want to thank... Paula for looking after the desk tonight, Neil for taking care of the music, and Anne in the background who sets all the new stations up and sets us up with a nice package to people to reach. And the latest station is Firehorse Radio, which is firehorse.com. If you want to download the pods from there. So the station is grow sorry, the program is growing. We're getting out there and uh, onwards and upwards. The numbers have been great, the reception has been great. If we can just solve the sound problem, it'll be absolutely perfect. But we'll get there in the end, and they won't be able to take us down because I'm absolutely convinced there's something dodgy going on here. It only happens as soon as the show starts. Anyway, I hope you're all getting ready for the the Yule season. I hope you all had a wonderful solstice. We have now passed the time of darkness. The god Lu, the Gaelic or the Celtic god of the sun has slaughtered the darkness and he celebrates by impregnating the goddess Eryu by the shaft of light, a shaft of pure pro photons from the sun which entered the chamber at Newgrange in the Boyne Valley in Ireland. A very special place and a very special event where thousands of people gather every year. Not always does the sun penetrate because some years it's cloudy. This year it was cloudy but it doesn't matter anyway. The ritual has been happening for thousands of years and will continue to happen for thousands of years as a symbol of man's communion both with the earth and with the cosmos and our place in both of it and these things are lost during this time of year have you noticed like have you ever noticed how in the media at the moment the mainstream media how all the scare stories about ebola deadly viruses and terrorism isis etc they suddenly stop about two or three days before Christmas Eve. That's because they don't want the interfering with the shopping and the travel plans. It just goes to show you how fake and contrived the whole thing is. The one time, like, do terrorists take a break for Christmas? Do a so-called Islamic terrorist take a break for Christmas? Apparently they do. Do viruses stop replicating for Christmas? They seem to. They magically disappear. And this shows you what a scam this is. And this is the world that we live in. And that's the lords of perception, of it, as I called them. If you look over to my website, there's a book there. You can get through the bookshop. I don't take donations, but if you want to help me out, I have a couple of books that you can get through the website, thomasheridanarts.com. Just click on the bookshop tab. One of them is The Animal of the Psyche, and the other is The Valpurgis Nike. And both books are a good accompaniment for this show and the topics I bring up and what I talk about and how I feel about the world. But if you if you can't look at what happens when the mainstream media suddenly stops reporting about deadly viruses or potential terrorist attacks, and also all of a sudden, as the shopping season, the last minute shopping season kicks in, the last few days before Christmas Eve, you get sudden stories about, oh, people coming home and all the families traveling and gobshites who propose to their girlfriends at the airport and all this kind of nonsense. Uh, spend, 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 party, 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 spend, 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 party, party, party. And then 
after New Year's Eve, it all gets normal again. Back into the what the merchants of nonsense present us with, the, the fake terrorist stories and the fake virus stories. If you can't see this, then there's no, well, you know, there's lots of people who don't see it because it hasn't been pointed out to them. But if it's been pointed out to you that you, there's clearly a bizarre Christmas psyop where nothing bad happens, then you, there's something wrong with you. And if you, on my website, there was an article I wrote about a year and a half ago called uh, Obsessive Debunking Disorder. And it was basically a case that I laid out that people who are obsessed with debunking, these extreme skeptics, these extreme radicals, they're, they're mentally unstable. They're, they're, they're so trapped in their left brain. And yes, the left-right brain thing is true. It's just not true in the same, in the way the hippies say it is. But yes, the, the basic premise of the two partitions of the brain performing specific functions is true. They're so trapped in their hyper, hyper-vigilant left brain that they actually induce a form of schizophrenia. This is why so many of these skeptics and these debunkers are hostile, incredibly hostile. And I encountered one tonight. This guy came on and basically said that the, there was no proof that Savile did anything. And uh, he, only, he only jumped in for the simple reason that I mentioned the fact that the British royal family and Margaret Thatcher had a direct hand in protecting Savile for 40 years. That was the trigger for him. I caused him to doubt authority. See, this is what these skeptics and the debunkers are about. They, they, they're not skeptical. They're not really looking for meaning or truths in anything. What they're really looking for is adherence and subjugation and unconditional uh, devotion to authority. The more, like I said, I've often pointed out before that the, the higher educated, formally educated a person is, the more easier they are to brainwash, the more easier they are to con- control because they've had to repeat everything an authority figure has told them right up until their PhD. There's no no ability for them to think outside the box. It has to be exactly what the professors ahead of them, the tenured professors, expect from them and to adhere to these this framework and to these dogmas and to these uh, statutes of limitations of their psyche. And that's why they're so easy to recruit into cults and so on after they graduate. This is why cults, the most bizarre mind control and flying saucer cults are all filled with people with PhDs and the master's degrees because the cult leader has just become the next authority figure from their professor. They're incapable of free thought and they don't like it. They don't want it. And that's why that guy freaked out tonight on Facebook when I simply just mentioned that Savile had been protected for 40 years by the British establishment. This is the mind of the skeptic. This is how they think. It's not about a quest for knowledge. It's a quest to defend orthodoxy, to build a wall around orthodoxy, to build a wall around authority, and develop a siege mentality. Do not be coming in here with anything that, that challenges my absolute faith and devotion to my authority figures in the mainstream media, in education, in leadership and even as far as the stupidity of royalty. We're going to be talking about Prince Philip tonight. We're going to talk about a few interesting things tonight. I want to talk about the destruction of the music industry and several other things like that. It's a, As I says, we've, we've passed extreme darkness, and we're at a point now where the, the light is returning again, and the world is being restored. The solstice has passed. And it's an interesting time, this, because for me, it's a, very, it's a very empowering and a very enlightening time. For people who are very skeptical, it's a terrifying time, because there's even articles on these skeptical and debunker sites talking about how to survive, quote-unquote, the horrific trauma of Christmas and the holidays. I mean, it's just ridiculous. Instead of them going to their, okay, if they don't believe in God, they're atheists and all this stuff, just go to your friends or your family's parties and enjoy yourself, for Christ's sake. Have some turkey, have a few drinks, sit down, relax. Oh, no, they're traumatized. They're traumatized because they have to deal with it. So when this guy was acting like this tonight, I just decided to look up the history of skeptics 
and I have this book on philosophy, and it says, The skeptics also quested for the good life, but their solution was other. Skepticism was invented by Pyro. He lived about 300 years before Jesus, who thought if Jesus existed, who uh, explained that it was unwise to believe in anything. He allegedly carried this belief to extremes by walking near the edge of cliffs and in front of horses until he died at the ripe old age. Like Herlitocles, Sextus, who was a Sextus Empiricus, you know, he said that skepticism produces happiness because by having no dogmatic beliefs, you become free from worry. See, that's true. I actually agree with that. If you have no dogmatic beliefs, you're free from worry. But the problem is with the, with the, uh, the skeptics is they do have dogmatic beliefs. Even though sex has pointed out that all knowledge is relative and so untrustworthy and that nothing can be ultimately ever proved, any proof itself has to be proved, and what proves that proof has to be proved, and so on ad infinitum. But in the end, all skeptics cheat because they're always dogmatic about their one central doctrine, relativism, which leads to Darwinism and all those other things. So they're not even skeptics. What They have a dogma of them, their own the infallibility of relativism. And what's, what's, I was quite upset by how, how on Christmas Eve this guy became hysterical. He was using like really incredible language towards me, like I was being grilled in the dock by a liar. And he was like, you know, what did Savile do? How can you prove it? What did Savile... I mean, the guy was literally psychotic. He's psychotic because the solstice has passed and those of us who try to be more sort of holistically grounded between a, a sort of, you know, a more kind of inclusive state of accepting that maybe, you know, the hermetic maxim of as above, so below, there should be, there's some truth to it. We find this a very calming, relaxing, in very deep period. They find it terrifying. They go into psychosis because they're in a period where they're surrounded by ritual. They're surrounded by the rituals of first the solstice, but also things like Hanukkah, the Christmas religious rituals, and all these other things. And they find millions and millions of people all around the world indulging in this. They don't. And they're right. They're always right. So watch out. If you, have, if you know any kind of like extreme atheists or these extreme debunkers and skeptic types at the moment, they'll be quite insane at, the, at, at this present time because... They're in basically a psychic maelstrom that's composed of all the things that they believe are nonsense or do not exist and having to face the fact that billions of human beings do accept and do believe these things. But they're always they're always right. I was reading Colin I was reading Colin Wilson's book. Actually, it wasn't. It was a Colin Wilson's book on the Necronomicon. And there was a great paragraph in it where he talk, he, sp he speaks about H.P. Lovecraft, the horror writer. And as Lovecraft wrote his last story in 1937, his stories became more terrifying as the, the specter of death came closer. But also, 37 was an interesting time as well in this uh, in the history of the world. We had the National Socialism reaching its zenith in uh, Germany. We had the Bolsheviks going bonkers in, uh, in the Soviet Union and Ukraine, killing anything that they, they felt they needed to kill in order to, to enforce their power. That's another thing about these skeptics. These skeptics are so, so rigidly you know, devoted to dogma that the same guy you would take today who may be talking about, who may call himself a liberal and defend gay rights and all this and defend this, that, and the other, if you were to take him and put him in his time machine and place him as a, as a Russian among, in Soviet Bolshevik times, he would be defending Stalin's purges. If you would take him to Germany, he would be defending the death camps under Hitler. That's how they are. It's always about authority. And H.P. Lovecraft was very much like that. He was a small town bigot from Providence on Rhode Island. He had a, a great, he's a genius writer. That's probably, his bigotries and his prejudice probably made him that way. But he, uh, towards the end of his, his, his final, the end of his life, he, his, he not only did his, his, his stories become darker, but they, they, he was used terms like forbidden, hideous, 
loathsome, shuddersome, with increasing, you know, with increasing frequency until, until the year, the final story, the year of his death, 1937. This, that's how he was. He was he was exploding. Everything he believed, everything that Lovecraft believed to be, I won't use sacred, but, you know, sacrosanct, the same thing, I guess. It was falling apart in front of him, and his uh, his fears of the supernatural, which he had created, had always almost manifested as a tulpa inside his own mind. And that's what's happening with these people now. The rest of us, we're relaxing in the rituals. I'm not a Christian, but I go to Christmas dinners. I don't have a problem with that. I don't have a problem with people going to midnight mass. Right now, in this, all over Ireland, people are going to midnight mass. There's nothing wrong with that. It doesn't bother me. I'm not a Christian. It doesn't bother me. I'm not Jewish. I'm not bothered by people lighting the, the Hanukkah lamps. That's We need ritual, because ritual is what grounds us to our community, but ritual also grounds us to the tribe. And we're losing our tribes. That's why we're increasingly finding soul tribes on the internet, on places like Facebook and all the social media. If you use it properly, you'll discover yourself as being part of a soul tribe, a different kind of tribe. And uh, I think more and more people are finding themselves in that world as the, shall we say, the reality matrix tumbles further and further into self implosion. It's it's always a time that I, I recall from when I was a kid, the horror shows, the horror programs on the BBC. The BBC ran a phenomenal series, well, should we say year it was year after year, annual event of ghost stories at Christmas. They were in the they were often commissioned for TV, but some of them were actually written by famous writers like Charles Dickens. And one that stuck with me very deeply as a child was a, a, a short film called The Signal, starring Denham Elliott. I think it was from 1975 or from 1976. It used to be on YouTube, but it's not there now for some reason. I guess the BBC commercial division, yeah, 76, pulled it. And I watched it as a kid. It's not only terrifying, it's also brilliantly made. Now, it, it tells the story of a, a signalman at a, at a railway signal box in a remote railway branch in England, and a stranger, who's basically exploring the area, comes and visits him. It's, it's brilliant. It's an, I've, it's, if you haven't seen it, you have to see it. It, the performance by Denham Elliott is sublime, absolutely sublime. There's only two actors in it, and basically a, another actor playing a spirit, but it's not a speaking role. As these kind of historical dramas go, it's easily one of the best. But it was these these ones and these programs like this were always produced at Christmas time, just like because it was about that period after the solstice, New Year's Eve. Christmas Day, St. Stephen's Day, or Boxing Day, as they call it in England. There's a, a, the, the veil is even thinner, I think, sometimes than Halloween. There's something there. And those of us who have a kind of a, I don't like the word spiritual, a sort of a, like a consciousness nature, we fluctuate between these two worlds. People who are highly skeptical, they find themselves having these same emotions, having these same synchronicities are also incredibly high at these periods. But these uh, skeptical types, they have these same emotions we're having, but they they believe them, or they've conditioned themselves to believe they're irrational. And this is what leads to psychosis within them. But what is also very interesting about the, this period of BBC horror dramas during the 70s was it was also the height of the the evil within the BBC, where Jimmy Savile was praying at his to the max, where the likes of Gary Glitter was the biggest star, and all these people would have Christmas, jolly Christmas specials. It's a knockout. All these jolly Christmas specials hosted by these monsters, and it's almost as if the 
the suppressed shadow of the BBC would be reflected within these horror stories because it always comes to the surface and this time of year it does come to the surface more than any other I was reading there a couple of years ago we listening on the radio they said that more antidepressants are prescribed and taken around this time of year than any other time of year more women and children are admitted into uh, battered wives shelters at this time of year than any other time of year this is because as we as we become more and more engineered by the laws of perception and more and more commercial where Christmas is purely a shopping drinking celebrating things the unresolved and repressed shadow of the society explodes to the surface at this time simply because of that period of darkness and light and the thin membrane which separates them that falls between the solstice and the end of Yule which is generally around January 5th and we're going to go to the first song now and I'll come back to you right after this tune and welcome back to the Velocity of Now the second half of the first hour I was talking to Paula, the producer of the of the air there, and apparently the suspicions that we were attacked last week is true. They brought in a person who knows about servers, and apparently, like last week, uh, we were pinged to feck, as uh, I'm nicely putting the the what's happening on. Uh, we're being attacked. The show is the show on the server is being attacked, which is the most wonderful compliment to me and everyone who listens to this show and takes part in it. Because uh, to do this on a Christmas Eve, it really shows how how pathetic they are. And if you work for some organization or some group and you're involved in this, you should do some real soul searching. Because all I'm doing here is bring love, happiness, and human decency. And all you're trying to do is kill it so thank you now I was watching uh, segments from Stanley Kubrick's Full Metal Jacket there the other day and uh, a synchronicity happened a powerful one and uh, at the final scene in that movie I remember when I first saw the film when I came up back in the day it left uh, it, le- it left me it left shudders down my spine it's that final scene where they're walking away from the battlefield at night with all the flames burning and the ones who survived they're singing this theme song from the Mickey Mouse Club and watching that again you know M-I-C-K-E-Y-M-O-U who's the leader of our gang blah, blah, that kind of that stupid song and I, I, I Kubrick is such genius I knew he got that from somewhere you know there's there's no there's nothing in his uh, in his work that does that comes out of nowhere. There's he, he definitely he, he you know he harkens back. He pulls from the archetypes. He he knows a lot about obscure history, and it kind of ties in. Actually, I know exactly what he based it on. You know, I based I know what it was. He based it on an historical event that took place during the Seven Years' War, and it was it, it took place under the reign of. Well, actually, I was studying this for uh, a new film I'm producing called From Prussia with Blood, Frederick the Great or Frederick the Second of Prussia. After the Battle of Lutheran, the Prussians won an incredible victory against an overwhelming Austrian army. The Austrians were trying to take back Silesia, which is now met present-day Poland. And the Prussians under the leadership of Frederick the Great won an astounding victory they not only killed twice as many Austrian troops Austro-Hungarian troops as they lost but they lost no flags and captured something like 50 plus Austrian flags now you say what's the big deal of a flag 
Oh, that's magic, folks. That's why if you captured a French eagle during the Napoleonic Wars, you were basically became David Beckham of the British Army or whatever army you did it. When you captured the flag of the enemy, you captured its magical talisman. And so this, like the fact that this battle had been won by the Prussians against staggering odds, they were outnumbered two to one, not only in troops but also in cavalry and guns. And they captured 51 Austro- Austro-Hungarian flags and routed the Austrian army out of Silesia. It, it brought Frederick the Great to a level of not just a, a king or an emperor of Prussia, but he became a supernatural entity. And when the battle en- ended, a, an unknown Prussian soldier standing near Frederick the Great besa- began singing the Lutheran choral, which was a tune that was written about a hundred years before by Bach, a religious tune. And the hymn was then taken up by the entire Prussian army that survived of about 25,000 men as they marched out of the field at night. And that's where Kubrick must have gotten the inspiration for the final scene of Full Metal Jacket as the American troops are leaving the burning battlefield and singing the Mickey Mouse Club theme. But also, what does it tell us about who they're fighting for. The Prussians were fighting and dying for the Prussian aristocracy, the most powerful noble bloodline in the world. The American troops were fighting and dying in Vietnam for entertainment, Hollywood and Disney. That's not to denigrate the troops who died there. I'm just saying that's what the psychopaths in charge had them doing. And Kubrick, using that ironic, that scene ironically, but powerfully, almost satirical, sent up the entire U.S. administration and its military objectives as being nothing more than the destruction of young American men and people in Indochina for the the cause of entertainment. You see, this is why I believe that that Jim Morrison was absolutely, you know, an insider. His father was the guy who basically started the Gulf of Tonkin, which was the Vietnam War. There's a photograph of, of Jim Morrison, a young Jim Morrison, on the deck of his father's battleship. Not long before he became this Dionysian rock god, And he's on the deck of the battleship with his father as this clean-cut, you know, all-American boy, army brat, Thai Navy brat in this case. And then in no time after that, he's on stage looking like Jesus, that Dionysian archetype. And he's around for a few years as sort of like the, the voice of dissent with a band that I think are absolutely horrible, The The Doors. Uh, I don't don't get them at all. And uh, that's just my taste. But I, I even instinctually, when I was young, I felt though something wasn't right about The Doors. Musically, they made no sense. It sounded like he was a bad cabaret singer who'd just been trained in cabaret and, and was stuck in front of a band that didn't have a bass player, just like this really obnoxious organ that just like went on catatonic. It like made made you feel like either insane at first from the the, the kind of monotonous tones that of Ray Manazarek's keyboards that go nowhere to the point where you just became submissive to it, almost like a kind of a brainwashing thing, and you gave in. I think also the fact of Morrison's debt is has a lot to do with the. I don't believe he died. The fact that he was found in a, a bathtub. He died like a Dionysian character. You remember, he was he was buried in water, his father in the Navy, there he was on the battleship, and he demised in water in a bathtub in Paris as he played this Dionysian rock star on the way. And the people who 
where behind his uh, his whole thing of his drug dealing, there's some very dodgy characters like this this Marianne Faithful person. Who, you know, who is she? Why does she like she lives in Ireland now in a, in the lodge in a house belonging to the Guinness family? Like, why why is this talentless bimbo everywhere? And why is she the one who's the main source for the fact that that Morrison died? of a drug overdose because her boyfriend apparently brought the drugs over and then that drug dealer died shortly afterwards and then Morrison's girlfriend she dies afterwards the death cult springs up around his grave and even there was a about 2007 there was a journalist for the New York Times I think his name is Sam Bernard claimed that Morrison he died of a massive overdose in the toilet of a nightclub in Paris at the place called the Rock and Roll Circus, which, and his body was, in order to not implicate the drug dealers, was brought back to the apartment and dumped into the bath. This, you know, it's and there was no autop- no autopsy was held on uh, on Jim Morrison's body. I don't believe for a second that Jim Morrison was a real rock star. I don't for a second believe he died. I believe he was a creation of the Pentagon to fulfill all the archetypes. He was born in water and he died in water. And uh, I don't know why I went to that segue. Oh, I guess it kind of ties in, but uh, there are there's always these they're always playing on our emotions, and that's what Kubrick was trying to tell us with the with the scene the Mickey Mouse Club that it's always that the the god of entertainment is what American troops die for as much as much more than freedom or liberty or freedom of speech. It's freedom of Hollywood to screw with our heads. That's really what they're dying for. It's freedom of advertising to rape us. It's freedom of speech for politicians to to bamboozle and, and fill us full of crap. That's what the freedom is about. That's what they die for. Now, speaking of German royalty, it was a slow day at my my day. I have a, I work at the weekends, and it was a slow day last week at work. And I found in a bin, ironically, a book called His Royal Highness Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh written by George Baker and was published on Redline Press in 1961. I had to stop myself from reading this book at one point as I was bursting out laughing. It was written, written at a time when these royals, these, these British royals, were still kind of gods in the eyes of everyone. There was no skepticism but before Johnny Rotten and God Save the Queen. And to read this book and the language it's written in, is it's almost like a religious devotion to this, the consort of the present Queen Elizabeth. It, every, he's, he's amazing. He's just amazing. Prince Philip is... Uh, I read this book and he's amazing. Uh, if he played football in the school team, he was so good, he could have played for Manchester United or Barcelona. That's how good Prince Philip was at football. If he played a game of cricket, oh, he was he was definitely he was definitely professional level. He could have represented England in a Test match against the top players of Australia, the West Indies, of South Africa. He was, a, he, was a, he was a naturally brilliant cricketer. If Prince Philip, you know, if he got on a horse and played polo, he was world class polo player level. The the sycophancy and the endless adulation of this Muppet is unbelievable. I was waiting for them to tell me when they had a, he had a 20-inch penis. But when you read the book, and the reason I read it, A for boredom, but B, in this kind of post-awakening time, we can see the lie behind the official narrative. You know, you, you, re- you really do read those spaces behind the lines. And it's also been very good for my own, you know, me, very interested in the Prussian aristocracy and the relationship to the world. And so there was a, it just confirmed how Germanic these aristocrats who run the world are. Now, Prince Philip was born in 1921. His father was Prince Andrew of Greece. Now, this guy, Prince Andrew of Greece, wasn't even Greek. He was Danish, and he was a educated in Prussian military. Here we go again. I'm always telling you the Prussians. Prussian military style. And he decided to leave the Greek people, you know, 
nice guy that he is, in a war against Turkey and capture Asia Minor, where most of the people would have been ethnically Greek anyway, from the Ottoman Turks. The, the, the military invasion of Turkey went okay for a while. They did fairly well. There was nothing wrong with the Greek army and their tactics. And then the Turks, basically on the outskirts of Ankara, which is almost in central Turkey, so they were almost packed into Asia at this point, uh, organized themselves, regrouped, and hit back at the Greeks, and they hammered the bisto out of them. And as a result of that, this pr Prince Andrew, who tried to see himself as the Frederick the Great of Greece, with his Prussian military training, was thrown out of Greece, and a republic was declared. And young baby Prince, his son, young baby Prince Philip, was born in Corfu, off the coast of Greece in Ireland as a exiled king now the book at this point gets even funnier it talks about his disadvantaged childhood now he was so poor Prince Philip was so poor as a young boy right that he didn't want to bother his parents to buy him a new winter coat so he started a fund and he started a fund with the, a pound note that he was given for Christmas by the king of Sweden. Now how many of us have been given a pound note by the king of Sweden? I mean, and they're just talking about how poor he was and how he had to fight for everything. So through this and his idiot batter, the Greek, Greek the, Greece declared itself a republic. They ended up in forced in Paris where he went, you know, he did the charmed lifestyle, but they still try to make out he was poor. And then he went to Germany. And when it gets very interesting when he was in Germany because we've all seen the famous photographs of him marching with, uh, at a Nazi funeral. And what's really amazing is there was nothing English about him or the family. He was pure German, Danish, Prussian. The Greek thing didn't even come into it. Now, to prove that, he had three sisters, right? Now, they were related to the, 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 the princes of Hesse, okay? Germans, aristocrats, Prussians, okay? Now, his three sisters had to be, were all, you know, the typical royal thing. They were married off. They were all made sure to be married off to. Sophie married. No, sorry. It's one of his, all four sisters were wed. Prince George of Hesse-Darmstadt. Nice uh, English name, that. Married Cecile, the father of the Grand Duke of Hesse. Germans which had a grandson of Queen Victoria herself. Uh, you know, she her consort was Albert, who didn't even speak English, Prussian. Then Marguerite was married to Prince Gottfried of holland lu Landeberg. He was descended from Queen Victoria, inbreds, being grandson of Alfred, Duke of Edinburgh, and the Saxe-Gotha, Saxe-Coburg-Gotha. And finally, Theodora's marriage, her husband, Berthold, was the son of Prince Maximilian of Baden. But they all married Germans. Not only that, one of the sisters married a high-ranking Luftwaffe officer. So while the the people of England were told the royals are, they're taking care of us during World War II, and they're looking after us, Prince Philip's brother-in-law was organising the Luftwaffe bombing of poor people in the East End of London. Right? This is royalty for you folks. It was all, you know, it was, when he was in Germany, he had to leave Paris at one time, and he went to Germany, and he studied at the, the Salem School in the, on the shores of Lake Constance. He was given, of course, his, uh, his big dowry to make sure he didn't go poor, uh, but he still portrayed in the book this official biography as being a poor little boy, and, of course, the Nazis come along, and how did Prince Philip react re 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 uh, you know, react to the Nazis. Now, remember, this book was published at a time when Prince Philip, we had not seen those pictures of Prince Philip marching with guys in SS uniforms. But it says here in George Baker's book, Philip found them comic. Their strutting goose steps made him laugh aloud as they passed in the street. As an outraged, nasty official promptly pointed out, but his sister and brother-in-law 
had no illusions about them. They were dangerous men. The Nazi creed was spreading like a flame in a gorse throughout Germany. A new leader had arisen who was promising revenge for the humility, humiliation and defeat of the Treaty of Versailles. Germany was to be for the Germans. Well, he would have been very happy there. Then. Already many had died because they opposed the new movement. Then a man who brutally trampled to death by five Nazis and their new leader praised them. This was no time or place for them, for Philip to jeer openly at what he found absurd. Princess Theodora was equally anxious for her safety, and that of her own family decided to send him back to the care of his uncle, Lord Mountbatten, in England. This, this is like a total rewrite of history to make this German, just, just, just Corfu German Greek aristocrat look like a kind of a working class impoverished guy who stood up against the Nazis while his his, his brother-in-law was dropping bombs on London and uh, the rest of the family were all tied up in the Prussian aristocracy who we all know from Albert Speer to Werner von Braun to Rudolf Hess did not swing at the gallows at Nuremberg when everyone else did one rule for them even in times of horrific war and another rule for us and there's even a funny part in the book where Prince Philip uh, for his first encounter <coughs> his first encounter with uh, Queen Elizabeth was going to you see they talk about it was so hard for the British royal family so very very hard during the war that they had to instead of having their usual ball and, reg and reg a gala ball at Buckingham Palace they had to retreat to Windsor Castle and perform a pantomime which young Philip found very amusing so while V weapons and Luftwaffe bombs from his brother-in-law were pounding British cities this guy was having a they were having a really hard time having to make do with just a pantomime in Windsor Castle now, it gets interesting how they deal with these guys in the military. He was not a British citizen at this point. He was still Greek. He had not, and that's another thing too, he had not been stripped of his Greek citizenship by the, uh, the Republicans in Greece. And so he was sent into the Navy as a kind of a neutral officer. Very strange. And he wasn't directly involved in combat because he's an aristocrat. They're not going to risk his ass on the battlefield. And so he, he was actually involved in things like merchant navy escorts troop escorts from australia to to europe that kind of thing however he did see combat and it's absolutely revolting when you read it what happened was so he could ha so they could establish him as a war hero quote unquote they sent him into a, a confrontation when two small italian warships tiny things were spotted off the coast of libya on the March 28, 1941, and Prince Philip, inside his massive British battleship, with her huge 15-inch guns, and another battleship, at close range, bombarded and exploded and literally vaporised these two defenceless Italian cruisers. Within both minutes, both, both ships were burning furiously and sinking. The Italian cruisers had no chance, and even Prince Philip said it was as close to murder in war as you could get. This was just a sacrifice. Two small Italian warships were blown to smithereens by two massive British warships, so Prince Philip could have a war service combat record. So after the war ends, and it's never explained why, he's out of the blue... On the same day he becomes a British citizen, in 1947, on 18th of March 1947, the London Gazette announced, among some 800 others, his naturalisation as a British subject. It was at, as Lieutenant Philip Monbatten, he took up the Monbatten name, not Battenberg as it really originally been, as his new British name. He wasn't Holstein Schwein whatever his real German name was, anymore. And he's, he's basically a Montbatten raised by the very sinister and appalling as his, you know, his protege, Lord Louis Mountbatten. 
And the same day, he becomes engaged to Queen Elizabeth. Out of the blue. Out of the blue. And it goes on to talk about the whole thing of them getting to know each other. What a weird way to live, right? Okay? And then it talks about their early days of marriage. And it tells us that they had no money. Like any young couple starting out in life, the Queen and and well, the Queen to be, Prince Elizabeth, Princess Elizabeth, and Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh, has been made, had to live off a modest income. So they were staying in some palace. They were refurbishing it with in priceless antiques that were given to them from around the world. And Prince Philip, of course, when they moved in there, worked with the top architects, even though they were a poor married couple, new married couple, to rebuild this palace, this castle. And he showed tremendous ingenuity in, 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 in working with architects to save space in their modest home of 32 bedrooms. How England has never become a republic is, is beyond me. But this was before... This book was, and then the rest of the book is all about all his charity works, how he's a great guy, he's no different than a bricklayer, and uh, the usual shite, okay, that, we, that, that they inflicted us with this garbage, royals and aristocrats. This was before the Profumo affair, and the, the whole sex games and the sex parties with uh, Christine Keeler and all that carry on that went on, and his file in that in that whole that whole sort of sex scandal has been sealed until 50 years after his debt and of course that was before Savile came along that was before all the other nonsense and Princess Diana and you know you saw the story what goes on there and he's still alive this guy this is the guy who said that oh the, he became the head of the World Wildlife Fund and then said if he had a choice if there was such a thing as a reincarnation, he would want to come back. He said this to a German newspaper. He would want to come back as an airborne virus and wipe out most of the human race. Classic aristocrat there. So this Greek, this Corfu-born German, Danish consort of Queen Elizabeth is also the kissing cousin of her because they're both direct descendants and not that far back like I think great-grandfather, of Queen Victoria and Prince Albert of Prussia. His three sisters are all married to Prus Prussian or German aristocrats who themselves, if you look back in their history, go back. Now, why is this? It's because of the cult surrounding Frederick the Great from Prussia with blood. Frederick the Great, after the Seven Years' War, took on a godlike figure. He took a country, Prus Prussia and Brandenburg, and created an empire, a place, part of the world that had no, no real uh, natural assets. It was disconnected from the sea and was spread between the Baltics and, and parts of Denmark, glued it all together around Berlin and created an empire, went to war against Austria, went to war against France, and went to war against Russia, and basically defeated them all. He was also incredibly lucky as well. Towards the end of the Seven Years' War, he was almost destroyed by the Russians, but what happened was uh, Catherine the Great suddenly died, and the uh, hostilities ended. And so that, was, that fed his cult, and this is why the European nobility are predominantly Prussian today, because they became obsessed with obtaining his bloodline. They wanted the blood of Frederick the Great, the great king. Even the Nazis, 1942, made a, a very good movie called The Great King. The Gross Krong uh, was especially commissioned by Joseph Goebbels. The film's actually very good. It actually shows a, quite a moving part of the scene in the film of the Lutheran Choral at the Battle of uh, Lutheran in 1757. Uh, Goebbels was trying to glue the mythology of Adolf Hitler with that of Frederick the Great or Frederick the Second. So they wanted his blood. They are obsessed with breeding. You know that. They're obsessed with bloodlines. They're obsessed 
with obtaining that blood and feeding it into themselves. And yet, you ask anybody, even the people in the alternative media, you say to them, who are, you know, who's, who's the, big, the big families? You get your brother Rothschilds, the Rockefellers, the Goldsmiths. Now, and, and, invariably, you will come to Queen Elizabeth II, but no one ever thinks that it all goes back to German aristocracy. Rothschilds, they were employed by the princes of Frankfurt. The goldsmiths were German, British, German, British, that English came from Germany. Even Henry Kissinger is German. British royal family, almost pure Prussian at this point. And so are many of the royal families that exist in Europe. You never hear about German monarchy, but it's there. It still exists. It never went away. It didn't go after the empire was dissolved. And Hindenburg didn't. The, the, the empire of Bismarck was basically dissolved at the end of World War I. And Hindenburg's attempt to revive it only to fail. Because National Socialism took over. It never went away. The peerages and the privileges of the Prussian aristocrats not only continued not only prospered, but are secretly behind the scenes, mainly through their work in Switzerland. Switzerland must be basically thought of as a kind of an experimental lab. You see, after the after the defeat of Napoleon, the Treaty of Paris in 1815, the Prussians in particular had learned an awful lot about social engineering and human behavior through the experiments that had followed in the French Revolution. So they, they learned from these things and they created, they basically gave, they created the unification of Switzerland and turned Switzerland into a neutral autonomous nation, not because they loved the Swiss, but because they could implement their experiments to use on the rest of us in Switzerland. And Switzerland became a kind of laboratory. Oh, it's just chocolates and cuckoo clocks me arse it is it's much deeper than that that's why they had the head of nestle that little chocolate company saying that water wasn't a human right switzerland is their laboratory and the prussian arist aristocrats are still the main scientists and it's the greatest secret and it's the hidden story that we never hear about so paula if you could stick on a song now in a minute and then the second half we'll be back talking about the music industry. And welcome back to the Velocity of Now, Yule Time Special Edition, with me, your host, Thomas Sheridan. On the controls, we have Paula and Neil looking after the music. I believe it's punk rock Christmas music tonight. And all the other people out there listening to the show and who sets up all the other stations. And uh, we forge on to the second hour. I think the first hour was quite interesting. As I says, we are being attacked left, right, and center. This is no hope. And this is no hype. Plenty of hope, but no hype. And, uh, you know, we'll make it. Nothing stops us here on the Velocity of Now. My website is www.thomasheridanarts.com. The YouTube versions of the show are uploaded on newsymbolsmedia.tv. And uh, if you want to support me, you can go to thomasheridanarts.com and buy a book. Like I said, they go perfectly w well with what we're talking about on the show. Now, music seems to be the theme again tonight at the show. Well, a few days ago, I was thinking about uh, Christmas songs. And jokingly, with a friend, we got I got my electric guitar, and I, I, we just jokingly wrote a quick song for a laugh. Uh, it was a, a kind of a piss take of a heavy metal sexist ballad. And I called it, I'm hung like a mule for Yule. It's like, so it was, it was a bit of a laugh. And then I just started thinking about, you know, Spinal Tap, which is a you know, wonderful film we all love. And I started thinking about, you know, Bad News, which is, a, which is the other spoof documentary, which came out around the same time on British television. And the idea of, you know, music parodying itself. And that's a healthy thing. But that was 30 years ago. And you look at the appalling vista of music today. It's, and you see, we have to separate the music industry from music. They're two different things. Music will always go on. Bands will always survive. P 
people will always write music from the hearts and play from the hearts. That will always happen. Music industry is a different beast, and we sometimes forget that. But the, the music industry today is a catastrophe. Not only is it full of crap, unlistable garbage that is just auto-tuned into madness, so-called great quote-unquote artists who look like they're on the game, half of them, or, you know, should be in some kind of a, a club on the Reaper Man. And they're, uh, they're lip-syncing on stage in front of thousands of people who pay 80, 90, 150 euros, dollars, to see this garbage, to see people like Mariah Carey swinging her beef curtains in front of the stage and all this kind of rubbish. And we're told how amazing these people are. At the same time, we have the X Factor American Idol kind of psyop. Where did, why did we get this bad? Why did rock and roll die in the music industry in terms of music promotion? And why, why did that all happen? And I was thinking, talking about joke metal songs, I was thinking of a band. Uh, let me tell you about this. About early 2000s, there was a show on the BBC called Later, Later with Jules Holland. I think it went down Friday or Saturday nights. And this was the kind of show I should have loved. I should have loved this show. It was live performances by bands, often bands I liked, like The Cure and New Order and all kinds of other groups I liked were often on the show and performing live, hosted by Jules Holland, the, the keyboard player from Squeeze, and it was a, a kind of a specially selected guest of celebrities to promote their new crap. And I should have loved the show, but the show always made me feel crap. It always did. I can't explain it. It always seemed like the ones who are on the show are this, the musical acts we approve of. And they became increasingly stupid as the weeks went on. I can remember a band called The Magic Numbers once, and I was like, why is this crap? Why is this on here? It's rubbish, you know? They're not good enough to, to be a you know a rock band. They're not good enough to be certainly got a BBC late night program that gets millions of viewers but then one week there was a band on that I thought was a joke they were called The Darkness I thought they were some kind of a you know spoof band like Spinal Tap and the, the guitar player singer jumped on a piano and was just like had this falsetto voice I believe it if they go no this kind of thing right and uh, I was like what is this shite what, what is this and uh, at the same time, too, I was hearing some pretty tasty guitar riffs, some pretty nice Thin Lizzy type twin guitar playing, some interesting, like, you know, good proper riffs in amongst all this like comedy of this guy who dressed like kind of like a bad, this kind of like goofy looking version of Freddie Mercury. And, it, you know, I just asked the end and then I saw the video for that song a few weeks later. And it was pure Spinal Tap. They're on a spaceship. And, you know, they even appear in the video the same way the band arrive on one of the scenes in Spinal Tap. They come out of, like, kind of, like, pods or true doorways. And I just thought that was, like, a one-hit wonder thing. What was interesting, that magazines like Metal Hammer and Kerrang! were actually giving them awards for their music and stuff like that. Now, the band seems to have been sincere at the time. But they're a very important band because they they were put into the spotlight in order to destroy the dignity and soul of rock and roll. They definitely were. And I'll tell you how it happened. The people who were into them were not really rock fans. There were people who could have easily been to Mariah Carey, Britney Spears, or anyone else. They were into them because they were famous and were on TV. That's when they were hyped hyped to high hyped to high heaven. They were hyped to high heaven, and that's why they were, that's why the darkness were, they were shoved out there in everybody's faces. You know, they, you could not get away from them. Now, the darkness, 
came from some town in England, Lois Grove or somewhere like that. They appeared to have built up a local following, but not as a rock band. They were, they were, they were kind of a gimmick live act. They were kind of lots of fun, but they were not taken seriously. And that's okay. Not every band should be taken seriously. But they do things like do handstands on stage and just that kind of thing. And it went on. And, and the manager of them seemed to have, I don't know who she was or what she was about. Her name was Sue something. But she seems to have had a vision for them that was beyond that of just a band. Why, who she, who she is, what she was about, I don't know. But the, the band could not get signed by a record company because all the record companies, they all thought, well, quite rightly, it was a gimmick act. It wasn't a real band. It was not a real band. It didn't have a real... It didn't have a real... Uh, meaning or anything and but they were apparently they were true they were almost like a bunch of young guys playing rock star they got a record deal and they were pushed into the front and somebody somewhere decided that they were going to be huge stars they were going to be a big band and they hit the ground running loads of hit singles the album sold really well every agent in the world was like oh the dark my favorite band of the darkness and I mean, I like a lot of that kind of music, but I just couldn't get into them. But at the same time, too, as I said, there were elements in their guitar playing that was awesome. There was like, it was classic, thin lizzy, slick rock. So the, these guys obviously had a good education in music to come up with this sound. But then they had on top of this ridiculous image, this kind of like Barnum and Bailey circus image that was even beyond Kiss. And it just seemed to be a mockery of rock. Now, the people, as I said, that got into them were not rock fans. They were people who were just into, like, anything that's famous. And after a while, they had a, a UK and Irish tour playing in big arenas like the O2 in Dublin. And a lot of the places were empty. Nobody was, no, a lot of them were half filled or quarter filled. And the band basically imploded after that because they discovered who their real audience were. The real audience are people who don't give a toss about, like, rock. They only want to be there for what's famous. And the, the proof of that is they reformed, I think, a few years ago. And the only big gigs they've done has been supporting Lady Gaga, which is their audience. Sorry, guys, that's your audience. At the same time that these guys came up and vanished was the period when the X Factor came along, Simon Cowell and all this type, where the quantification of musical talent was reduced to a kind of an Olympic sport that had nothing to do with soul or passion and everything to do with people who, a lot of them had no background in music like Cowell, telling them how to sound and what expecting them to behave a certain way. This was almost like what they're doing with Common Core in, in education. This was Common Core in the music industry. They were splitting the generations the people who'd grown up with rock and that rock and roll would last forever, would never die, as Neil Young said. They, had, they were going to kill it in the music industry. So they caused a schism. And then you had a generation who, oh, oh, what do you like? I'm into rock and roll. Oh, the darkness. Ah, stupid band. And rock and roll is dead in the music industry. And they did the same in indie music. The indie bands became increasingly stupid to the point now where you have Mumford and Sons who are the indie band of brain-dead college students who sing sea shanties. Feckin' sea shanties. This is how bad it's got. We have the biggest band the last few years does bloody sea shanties. And he sings like this. I'm a very old man. And I sing with Mumford and Sons. And all these feckin' eaters will buy yet. Da, 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 da. That was just to kill the indie side of it. So the darkness were used to kill the hard rock, heavy metal side of that tradition. To kill that that flow that had go, gone on since probably the MC5 in the 60s. And the darkness, oh, sorry, the Mumford and Sons finally killed the the indie music, which began with. Probably the Stooges in the 60s. 
gone. It's all gone now. And now we have Rhiannon and Lady Gaga and all this other nonsense. They had to smash one to begin with another. They, it, well, essentially, born smashing it, they had to degrade it and and take away the humility of these, the the, the dignity and the, the soul and the beauty of these things. The true beauty, when you, you hear a piece of rock music, and it, it hits you right there. They killed them, with, starting with the darkness, and they finished up. The, the first shot was uh, the darkness, and the last shot was the the coup de tap. Coup de glass was the Mumford and Sons nonsense. And the thing is that I bet the guys in Mumford and Son are probably can play and everything. They can probably have they probably have talent. But they're, they're someone somewhere says let's cap let's you know, let's let's make some money off all the morons in college who will think you're great because we'll tell them you're great. When they're singing their sea shanties. Ah, oh, we're in Cambridge, singing our sea shanties to a bunch of feckin' PhDs. Da 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 da. Mum for them songs. Jesus. I mean, that's what it's come down to. And, uh, so here we are, okay? Now, the music industry won't get away with this because people like, people like Simon Cowell and the people who run the record companies today, they probably all, actually record companies in the past were not always as despicable as they became to be. There generally was, generally were A&R people in the past who would, you know, sign up Neil Young or Bob Dylan or a, The Jam or someone like that with the best of intentions of being genuinely caring of the music and it, it meaning something to them, wanting to help this band and wanting to, to bring them along, it genuinely was real, where now you have a kind of a punishment factor. You are going to be recruited by this record company until we finish with you. I often, you know, I often think that Millie Vanilli had the laugh, the final laugh. I can remember, like I remember when that Billy, Mini Vanilli came in, I thought that song, oh, girl, you know it's true. I thought that song was quite catchy. I remember thinking of the pop songs at the time, it was one of the better ones. And then they had that Grammy taken away from them or whatever it was because uh, they mimed the song. That's the norm these days. And that's what they want. They wanted a cookie cutter industry of people who were visually marketable. I mean, Westlife. I don't know if people around the world know about Westlife. But Westlife are an Irish boy band who have no talent, none. And uh, they've sold millions and millions of albums. They have, you know, a massive audience all over the world. The, the their farewell gigs this time, their farewell gigs, they were in the largest stadium in Dublin, which holds like ninety thousand people. They sold something like eleven nights of that. Eleven nights of ninety thousand people to see five monk, four monkeys on a stage in suits, you know, miming and auto tuning and and this is what's come down to. There's no, even if you look back out boy bands in the past and stuff, you look at the Osmonds. The Osmonds at least did Crazy Horses. The Jackson 5 could play their instruments. And there was a, and they, they made the really good pop songs. It's not like that now. It's a machine generates them. It's all about money. It's all about the psychopaths in charge and the lords of perception within the record companies. Instead, you know, instead of having... A, a musical a musical actor a band who has a mind of their own the reverse happens I always think of I remember watching X Factor and Louis Walsh the manager of, of Westlife where they were looking that some guy come on with a girl and the guy had no had nothing in talent wise and looks wise that would be on being on a being on, an, on a playing in a pub or a nightclub somewhere that's the level that's the max he would get to he wouldn't even be good enough to get onto a like a cruise ship act, okay? And uh, Simon Cowell says immediately, no. And I, I was, I'm like to myself, I'm not surprised. And Louis Walsh goes, yes. And and Simon Cowell, even who he is, looked at Louis Walsh and says, why? And he says, because he'll do exactly as we tell him. And the guy goes, yes, Louis, I won't let you down. And that's what they want. They want monkeys in suits. And in, you know, 
G-strings who will do exactly as they're told. And that's why they killed off. They killed off rock and roll. They killed off rock and roll for that purpose in the music industry. It will always go on. There will always be bands. And that's why when you go to rock concerts today, of bands that are probably in their 60s at this point, everything from the Eagles to Kiss, a sizable proportion of the audience are under 25 because even the kids today, large numbers of them instinctually know that what Simon Cowell is presenting is excrement. There are people who will never get out of the boy band thing or the Rhiannon thing or the Lady Gaga thing because that's just the nature of them. They're the ultimate like robots. They're not capable of, of, it, of being into anything that's not, you know, formulated and handed to them. That's how it will always be. But there's a, you know, if you look at, like, I was looking at some, I was playing some Blue Oyster Cult songs the other day, and over and over again, and all the other bands were in that period when I looked at the comments on YouTube, I was born in 1995, and the music of the day sucks. I wish I was born in 1965. I wish I was born in 75. This kind of thing. Where do you think that comes from? That comes from the fact that these kids instinctually know, you know, shite from gold. They do. They instinctually know it. And they know that the music that's been given to them is not real and it's not sincere because people like Simon Cowell and Louis Walsh are themselves are not real and they're not sincere. I mean, I remember there was a time that I used to laugh at Kiss. And Kiss to me seemed like a, a, a well, you know, it seemed like a proper band compared to what we put out today. And in some ways they were. If you, listen, you read the history of the book, that band, it really, they actually were a real band. They, just, they wanted to be an American version of Slade. They weren't good looking, so they came with the makeup idea. And nothing wrong with that. But you compare them to what comes out today. And especially, you know, and then especially at the same time that those bands were, we had the rise of Britney Spears. Britney Spears was almost like the, the baton that was passed between the generation of good pop music and the generation of crap pop music. And she's obviously some kind of mind control slave. In every, in every interview of her, she's catatonic and spaced out and waddling around. This kind of thing. And uh, doesn't even know what she's saying. But there is one interesting clip that was shown in Michael Moore's movie, Fahrenheit 451, or Fahrenheit 911, sorry. And he says, uh, he showed a clip and somebody asked her about, you know, the, the Gulf War. And a whole new Britney Spears appears. She, uh, a very lucid, forthright and direct, she goes, I think we should support our president. And looks direct at the guy. The only statement she's ever made that had any kind of conviction to it, and it was pure propaganda. When she's not going, oh, 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 the rest of the time, which proved for me that she definitely is uh, some kind of mind control slave. I mean, I really do believe they do that with these people. And uh, the only thing I can explain it, there's nothing, and the fact that she came out of the, uh, the whole Disney thing, and, she, you know, it, she probably came from these parents who were probably, if you look into it, like, the same with Jim Morrison, the the parents are probably a well-connected uh, background. So uh, we're going to, that's the music industry and why, how it died, how it was murdered, how it was degraded. It's not the same thing, remember, now as the music as music. Music industry and music are two different things. Good music, good bands, good songwriting. And they, the spirit of rock and roll will go on and rock music and everything else will go on forever. It will never end. If something else will come up, it has to. I can definitely see a point now where a, a kind of a, a, I hate the word revolution, but in this case it's probably what it is. A revolution is definitely going to come. It feels like 1975 again. It's not that we have Emerson, Lake and Palmer doing 15-hour keyboard solos. <laughs> or anything like that, or Reg Lake dressed as Prince King Arthur on ice, you know, going around the keyboard and play, playing this, and all this crap. It's, a, it's, 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 a, it's the same, it's the same, uh, it's the same uh, thing. 
it's 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 at the breaking point. When I was younger, we used, I used to listen to Emerson, Lake, and Palmer, and go, uh, and fifteen hour keyboard solos, and yes, whole album slides the same song, and I used to go, no, you're not getting away with this. Uh, I, I, it's not going to fly. You know, this is not. It's not going to work. It's 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 not it's not real. I'm not going to fall for this. The same way I'm going to get people to listen to Mumford and Sons going. You know, we're Mumford and Sons and we're singing songs about sea shanties. Ah, you are, you are. I'm a jolly old man. Ah. And they're going to go. No, that does not represent me. That's control. Mumford and Son are today's Rick Wakeman's twenty-hour keyboard solo. Although I quite like Rick Wakeman. I love that story he told that when Yes played live, they were so... Uh, he, they were, the, 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 the solos, the guitar, the keyboard, the drum solos were so long that when he wasn't playing, he had like 30 minutes of a guitar solo to sit through and he used to order pizza and an Indian takeaway and it was delivered to him on the stage and he'd be sitting there with his like eating his Indian takeaway meal during the middle of a Yes concert. I do kind of find that very funny. But even Rick Wakeman says that. I knew at the time it was rubbish. They, they instinctually, Yes knew at the time that what they were doing was a joke and they couldn't get out. They couldn't believe that they were being paid to do this rubbish. So I'll go to a song now, Paula, when you're ready. And we'll see you in the final half hour of the show. It's a jolly old man, it's a jolly old man, it's a jolly old man, and see shanties. And welcome back to the final stretch of the Velocity of Now with me, Thomas Sheridan, on this you Time special, 2014. Doesn't it feel better already that we're past the solstice? We're winning against the forces of darkness. And we will win because psychopathy is not self-sustaining. It's a parasitic organism, whether it manifests through a cult, or a, or, a, or through a religion, or through a political system, or through a scumbag CIA, NSA, MI5 douche jockey who is working on this time of night for a, a pension in order to smash a show that's not doing any harm except making people think differently about the world while entertaining them and informing them and hopefully educating them. Yes, it's a, it's an amazing life. I was just talking to Paula there off the air. How you just never know what life is going to throw you. You know, here I am at a radio show. You just told me that five years, six years ago, I'd have a radio show written four books and, um, uh, I was hung like a mule for Yule. I would never have believed you. But here I am. Life is truly, you know, you never, you never know it down the corner. And that's because we, are, you know, someone said to me the other day, he said, how, you know, how does the system actually work? Who's at the top of the pyramid? I don't believe there's a pyramid. I think it's just two layers to society. There's us, the lab rats, and the, the farm animals. And then there's the psychopaths in charge, as Kira Young calls them. And they're just, uh, they're all the banking families, they're the military big shots, they're the governments, they're corporations, and they don't step on each other's toes normally. They just basically have a an agreement in that psychopathic layer that they exist on, that crud. You know, the way a septic tank does a, a, cr a crust forms on top. That's what they're like, that a crust at the top of the septic tank. And uh, we're the pure, clean water coming out of the septic tank at the bottom. And it will always be that way. We will always we will always be like that. Because we have one thing they don't have, the ability to create. To create. Now, going through my psychopath files. I know you love when I talk about my psychopath stuff. And you know, I know when you love when I talk about my Jungian stuff. That's always been very very good for me whenever I talk about archetypes and allegory and things like that it's always been people have always enjoyed when I talk about it when you can glue that to psychopathy it's really interesting now archetypes you know in human behavior archetypes they always manifest okay you will have the 
the you know you have the the benign market type archetypes the, the the maternal archetype the woman who's motherly even if she doesn't have kids she's very motherly towards other people she's caring she's nurturing she's always cooking making clothes and that kind of thing you have those kinds of archetypes you have the archetype of the the warrior the guy who stands up against injustice he's the warrior archetype he fights and you know he 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 stands for taking care of the ones who who need taken care of that's the warrior archetype but then you have other kinds of archetype they're not so benign and not so shall we say likable now then you have what i call archetypal coupling pathological like like a benign archetypal coupling would be a maternal nurturing woman with a warrior male sexy look very sexy we like that okay but very reassuring it's sexy because it's reassuring it's sexy because it's a uh, if you know there's everything good about it but not everybody is a warrior and certainly not everybody is a, a maiden okay now you have one particular archetypal coupling which I have noticed all my life and it's only now I'm beginning to see the importance of it and I found an old crime story that kind of shows you how powerful this dark archetype is and that's the archetype of the bombastic bloated pig female and the weasel man who are drawn together the bombastic female pig type archetype can often be a big horrific mother and her weasel son who she has crushed sometimes they come together naturally where you have a predatory weasel male a a pencil neck nebbish who's just on the make a greasy little dirt bag and you have the bombastic pig female archetype and they coagulate into a perfect pathological storm of combined combined predatory instinct where one feeds the other now they're not always they're not always you know heterosexual couples i'll give you an example i've often found joseph joseph stalin to be very very i'm getting a book out here because i'm trying to remember a, a, a russian name oh yes it's all very live here folks i'm i'm coming to you live from my library but i've often found joseph stalin that piece of crap uh, Soviet dictator to be very feminine even though he had a big bushy moustache and called himself Uncle Joe he uh, there was something kind of like he was he had that bombastic female uh, pig like archetype about him he he, he he had this kind of drag queen look with his his, his, P, his magnum PI moustache there was something about him there was something not right about the uh, the sexu- sexuality of Stalin. Now, he had that kind of relationship with a weasel of his own. It was a little cretin, who I can't find his name, who was this murderous dirtbag, who was responsible for many of his purges. It was a typical uh, situation. Here he is. His name was uh, Nikolai Yezhov. And he was a greasy little. He was the head of. He was a greasy little head of the NKVD, the forerunner of the KGB. And he was that weasel man, that cretinous little weasel. And the bombastic female archetype was the was Stalin. So it can happen in in a kind. Does not be a relationship between two people. But I stumble, and I've seen this all my life. I've seen these bombastic pig women weighing, you know, 20 stone with a weasel man, and they're always involved in doing no good to others. They coagulate for various reasons, but 
that it's almost like she seeks him out and he she he seeks her out. But I came across a story written by. Can I find the name of the author? See, a lot of these old, a lot of these older stories, they didn't credit the author. Anyway, it's a. It was about such a couple, and it's quite amazing the story and quite shocking. And I'll read it to you. It goes when well-built, lonely lady seeks young man with view to permanent relationship. Said the notice, application, please write to box two hundred three. Sitting in a squalid Lower East Side New York apartment, Raymond Fernandez studied the ad carefully. This was one for him. He wrote a letter that might have been called straight from a true romance magazine. I'm half Spanish, he wrote. Slim, dark, a veritable Don Juan, Don Juan, yearning for a pair of loving arms. That's it, psychopath type, you know, one dad. For those of you who want to know what they, they write, want to know what it's like, that's what they like. He admitted to say that he was also a vicious killer, had served two jail sentences, and was currently conning cash out of women who were advertised for permanent boyfriends. When Marta Beck, the well-built lady, who was in fact a mountain of flesh topping 20 stone, received the Spanish Romeo's letter that began to be forged, one of the most remarkable killing partnerships of the 20th century. You see, murder always seems to be the the end game for this uh, the, the the bloated pig female archetype and the her weasel enabler, and vice versa. They met for the first time at the old Port Authority bus station in New York. She did not recoil recoil from the weasel faced man who had already murdered two women and whose ill fitting toupee clearly showed. Nor did she, he shrink, she shrink on sight from the great barrel of lard bearing down on him. In fact, they fell in love at first sight. When she asked him what did he do for a living, he replied, and this has actually happened. Actually, I con money out of women who advertise in lonely hearts ads. With equal candor, she told him she thought that that was a good idea and, he, and suggested she should become his partner. In the months that followed, Fernandez and Marta Beck could have swayed through a lonely woman of America. Their technique for Marta was for Marta to pose as a new female lonely heart, as Fernandez's helpful sister, and Fernandez's helpful sister, as Fernandez's helpful sister, sorry, and then swindle the victims of everything she had. Their first victim together was a Pennsylvania school teacher. After convincing her he was a single man with a heart of gold. Fernandez married her, but Marta made sure he never enjoyed her physically. She shared the bridal suite with the bride, and when the bride protested, she was in- intimidated into submission. She was forced to hand over her money and effects of her safekeeping to the brother and sister. See, this is gaslighting. And in due course, she was told her investments were all gone and that she was broke. This is all, cults do this a lot too as well. Then in her first moment of rationality, she left her new husband. This incredible method by which the bride was conned out of her investments was repeated again and again by Fernandez and Beck. It was to lead to the murder of at least three women and the unproven suspicion that the two swindlers were responsible for the deaths of 17 others. The school teacher and the dozens of other women duped by the duo were lucky with the lucky ones. The scene set was soon set for violence. Myrtle Young was the next victim, a middle-aged widow. She couldn't understand why she had to share her marriage bed with Martha. When Fernandez got his hands on her money, her morning coffee was laced with barbiturates and she was put on a bus to Little Rock, Arkansas. She was dead when she arrived. The next victim, Janet Fay, handed over assets worth $6,000. Just, just think about how much money that was back then. When she wanted to write a letter to her daughter, telling her she was about to get married to Fernandez, Martha brought a hammer crashing down on her skull. Just business. With all of Martha's 20 stone weight behind it, the blow killed Janet outright. The partners then dug a hole in the cellar, buried the body in concrete, and then wrote a letter to Janet's daughter, Mary, purporting to come from Janet. Mary, her suspicions aroused by the letter, went to the police. 
the swindlers were difficult to trace because they were always on the move. See, there's a psychopathic thing as well. They're, they're, they're always on the move, and if they're grounded down in real life, in modern times, they move around the internet. And they had all, and they'd already contacted another victim, Daphne Dowling, Dowling, Downing. Sorry, was a widow left with a baby at 28. After, after she was introduced to her new fi- fiance sister, quote unquote, both Fernandez and Martez moved into her house with her. Her next shock was to discover that her fiance, without his toupee, <laughs> I shouldn't laugh. But the, the, you see, the the psychopaths. Male psychopaths, a lot of them tend to be weaselly and uh, cretinous and puny. And the the toupee thing indicates the poor loss of hair growth due to high testosterone rates. It has a very funny effect on them. The high testosterone with psychopaths doesn't make them often masculine or muscular or heroic. It makes them often makes them puny because they have tremendously high metabolisms. One of the things to do with this is acne and loss of hair at an early age. Guessing she was being duped, she screamed. The door was thrust open and massive, Martha's massive bulk stood in the rectangle it made. So the bombastic pig archetype, the other half of this pathological coupling, had entered the room. It's like that movie Misery, Kathy Bates. Kathy Bates in that movie Misery was the classic pathological, bombastic, psychopathic female archetype. Behind Daphne, Fernandez pulled a gun. A single shot was enough to kill the poor hysterical woman. The noise woke up Daphne's baby. Marta took the child, turned on the bath water and casually drowned it. Fernandez fetched a pickaxe, went down to the cellar and dug a hole large enough for the mother and child. He filled the grave with cement and then they went off together to a movie. See, this is the psychopathic thing. They've no, they've no, uh, it's just business. There's no emotional connection to it. Where a normal person took part in something like that, they'd be shaking and jittery and they, they just went to a movie. And the movie can exist to be a very common thing. With the, these psychopaths, like the the Moore's murderers, Myra Hindley and Ian Brady, often after they killed kids, went to see movies, and then would go and like review the movie and talk about it. So it's a psychopathic uh, persona switching. They enjoyed the movie so much that they saw it a second time around. When they arrived back home, the police were waiting. The neighbors had complained about the racket. This was the digging up the the, the base, but with a pickaxe. The officers insisted on a search, and when they found the still wet concrete in the cellar, it didn't take long to reveal the two bodies, the one of the woman Daphne and her baby, which uh, Martha Beck drowned. Sure, we killed them, Fernandez said with a shrug. But I'm not your average killer. I've always seen that as a professional way of earning a living. That's a psychopath for you. Let me repeat that. After two, a body of a woman... He had married on the false pretenses and a baby that him and his him and Marta had murdered was pulled out of the, the cement by the cops. He said, Sure as we killed them, Fernandez said with a shrug, but I'm not your average killer. I always seen it as a professional way of earning a living. Now that's not a psychopathic justification and nothing is. That's just like Cheney this week, isn't it? With the 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 uh, the torture. You see, I sure do it again. You've done it before, gasped the cop incredulously. A number of times, replied the killer, while Martha chortled with glee. He 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 he! This big pig, this big nicotine encrusted windbag bloated cell archetype pig bag female. He 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 he! Just think about what the cop saw that day. They were arrested. And while they were in custody, you know, I always think of these types, you know that scene in The, the Exorcist where the, the Catholic, the older Catholic priest is murdered and Father Karras comes back into the room and the, the, the demon 
who looks, even though it's a little girl, but they've made her look amazing, like these bloated, like that bloated pig, psychopathic, bombastic female archetype. And she's going, <laughs> that's where I imagine that Martha was like. They were arrested, and while they were in custody, police probing that probing revealed that although no one could be exactly certain, their final victim of tallies looked like 17. The trial was fixed for June 1949. As soon as Martha, and she was only 30 at the time, entered the courtroom, she ran forward to kiss and embrace Fernandez. I love him, she cried. I love him and I always will. The death sentence was invariable, inevitable for both of them. They were taken to Sing Sing and placed in cells opposite each other. The authorities decided that Martha was made of sterner stuff than a lover and that she would go th- he would go to the chair before her. While he was being executed, she ate a last meal of a double portion, you fat cow, of fried chicken and chips and salad. Then she wrote a note. Imprisonment in the death house has only strengthened my love for Raymond. Sitting in the chair, she even managed a defiant smile as the switch was pulled. And that, folks, is what a psychopath is. I've been telling you about that. I wrote two books about it, but that's how they are. Now, her love for Raymond was not love like like love that we think it is. It wasn't even psychotic love. What she had found, she was like a psychopathic jigsaw piece. And to complete the jigsaw, she needed another piece of the psychopathic jigsaw. And Raymond Fernandez was that. And by bringing the two of them together, she almost turbocharged herself. And he almost turbocharged himself. And this is, it's very rare for psychopaths to come together. But they will come together if they're socially deficient. That by themselves, they haven't got enough to have a successful predator life. So they need not only just an enabler, but they need a specific form of psychopathic enabler in order to fill in or compensate for the lack of social graces, good looks, or social intelligence that a, a, you know, a competent psychopath would have in order to move through society. So it's not just an enabler, it's, it's, it's a complementary enabler, a complementary psychopathic enabler. Moira Hindley and... Uh, Ian Brady would be another example of that. The Bush government leading up to 911 would have been an example of that. No matter how you feel about 911, personally I don't really care enough about it, but I see that when it was as it was happening, they were warned by everybody. They were warned by the the Japanese that attacks were coming. They were warned by the French, the British, the Israelis. Everyone told them an attack was coming. They either turned a blind eye or paid no attention because they were too busy. This band of this brigands, this band of brigands of psychopathic codependents, Cheney, Bush, Condoleezza Rice, and the rest of these maggots were too busy raping the United States, robbing the people's wealth, robbing the institutions of government to either notice, care, or give a toss. And what happened, happened. And all they saw it was, was an, at first, the fact that Bush hid shows that he was probably terrified he was going to be done for incompetence and probably had been thrown out of office. When he realized that wasn't going to happen, he arrived on the scene. They made a little plan with the rest of them to decide to use that event to rape the Middle East. That's what, that's what it was all about. That's, and that's the psychopathic coagulation. Anyone who's ever been in the workplace will notice that sometimes two psychopathic types, particularly if they're not smart, wise, or clever, or good-looking enough to do it on their own, 
will coagulate in the office in order to turbocharge and complement the one another's uh, machinations while compensating for their social deficiencies, their intellectual deficiencies, and so on. And that story of Marta Beck and Raymond Fernandez was a classic. That's why a lot I, these crime magazines and these crime these psych, uh, these criminal profiling books have been very useful for me for able to understand these beasts because they you also don't you don't only understand them at the at the the sort of pathological psychological level but you understand them at the archetypal level as well. It's interesting that they chose that the women that they would prey on women. They could have easily turned it around and had Martha write love letters pretending she was like this hot babe and then Raymond Fernandez doing the business. But the other way, it was the other way around. They, they decided to target women because what, what this bloated 20 stone pig female psychopathic archetype and really wanted was to harvest the energy of those women because she knew she would never have that in real life. So Fernandez gave that to us, and it was a harvesting thing. And that's, the psychopath is the ultimate harvester, the ultimate harvester of energy, of other people's labors, the ultimate parasite, a tapeworm is what I describe them as. And that's why we must always be vigilant. I've written two books on it, if anyone's interested. One is called Puzzling People, and the other one's called Defeated Demons. You want to know anything about these monsters in a very basic down-to-earth manner, that's where it is. Unfortunately, the whole field of psychopathy has now been spread all over the place where you have these these neurotic types who think that their ex-boyfriend dumped them, that their their ex-boyfriend only dumped them because he was a psychopath. That's clouded the issue, and that's going to only allow more Martha Bex and Raymond Fernandez to feed because they're, they're delighted with this confusion and this uh, this desire to, you know, this, to throw that phrase around so quickly. At the same time, you have Professor Kevin Hutton and Dutton and the rest of them not trying to normalize it. That's another thing. I just saw today that there's, a, there's all this hullabaloo that there's a black actor playing James Bond. And it's supposed to be a, a shocking thing or a big deal. This is how mental people are. Let's see, like, uh, folks who are worried about this, let me explain something to you. James Bond is a movie character. He didn't actually really exist. So what skin color he is or what accent he talks with is kind of irrelevant because this is called acting. Actors act and they play roles. Was a... Uh, the, uh, 90% of the actors who played Jesus Christ were not Arabs or Jews from the Middle East. They were white dudes. You know? People are so stupid, actually, when I think about it. But, again, the Lords of Perception have trained people to think this way. The Lords of Perception have trained people to believe that only their roadmap for the human consciousness, their roadmap for the human psyche is the only one people should follow. The only one that has validity. Bringing us back to the skeptics at the beginning. They are the ultimate slaves to the lords of perception. That's why you have college, I would think college rock, oh, you know also the worst bands are in college rock bands? The worst bands the worst bands are college rock bands because a record company could take, in the old days, the, the crappiest indie band and put them on the college circuit and tell the college students, all these, these highly educated students, that this is the cool band, just like they're doing at Mumford & Sons now. And they believe it. They believe it. Submission to authority. Submission to orthodoxy. The boss is always right. And the psychopathic control grid depends upon that. This is why it's not just because we passed the solstice. You can probably see there's a difference in my voice. I'm a bit more fired up and a 
up for it and a bit more relaxed than I have been in the recent shows, but we've also passed the point of darkness. This is the point where the seeds of creativity are now sown for the following year. So those of you who are songwriters, write your songs now. Plan your styles of music. Learn new, learn your instruments. Develop a new relationship with your craft now. Those of you who are artists, develop a new relationship and cultivate new expressions of the aesthetic. Those of you who are poets, infuse yourself with language that will now feed you in the months of light ahead. Because this is the time the psychopaths are in deep confusion. And this is the time of year when those of us who don't fall for all this Christmas commercial nonsense have the ability to actually jump ahead, to move ahead and get in front of them. They no good this time of year and they're their gatekeepers and their vanguards and the, the skeptics and all the all those the media they're off guard at the moment. The media have stopped reporting on Ebola and terrorists because they want people shopping for the Christmas. They're off guard. Politicians aren't working around this time. They're off doing whatever they do. The skeptics and the debunkers and the slaves to orthodoxy are feeling very alone right now. They don't have leadership. They don't have politicians and journalists telling them what to do. And they're surrounded by those of us who understand the importance of the days between the solstice and the end of Yule around June 5th of the magic of this time and how the application of rituals, even if you don't believe it, and the application of exploring other aspects of consciousness, the aspects even of looking at our spirituality are so powerful and in that moment we create. So thanks very much for sticking with me for the last two hours. For those of you who tried to kill the show, get a load of that. Thank you to Neil for the music and Paula for being as vigilant as ever, running the background and everyone else involved in this show. And uh, we're coming back next Wednesday. Nothing stops us on the velocity of now because we live in the velocity of now and feck them if they can't take a joke.